Girl Scout Troop 13826 will present the flag. May I please have your attention for the procession of the flags? Color Guard Attention. Color Guard Advance. Color Guard posts the colors. Color Guard honor your flag. The Minnesota League of Women Voters and Guests, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard Open Ring. Color Guard Dismissed. Thank you, Girl Scouts. Good evening, my name is Suzanne Kerwin and I am president of the Edina League of Women Voters. And I'm Kay Ahill, president of the Bloomington League of Women Voters. Welcome to this evening's program on civil discourse beyond gridlock. It's great to see such a crowd here tonight interested in this important, what we believe to be a very important topic. League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization that has been active in Minnesota for over 50 years. While we as a league do studies and take issues on positions, we do not endorse political parties or candidates. League of Women Voters encourages citizens to be informed and active participants in government. And if you are interested in learning how to make an impact on local, state, or even national issues, I encourage you to take some of the League of Women Voters information off the tables outside the door before you leave tonight. Our membership is open to men and women. Now tonight, the views expressed in this forum are those of the panelists, not those of the League of Women Voters, except for Stacey Deppner hovey She is the president of Minnesota League of Women Voters, so she will have the League viewpoint. <laughs> Thank you, I've got a few guidelines for our very welcome audience tonight. Would you please take out your cell phone? <laughs> and then go ahead and turn it off. Thank you. There is no audio or video recording of the program tonight, but the program will be recorded for webcast and cablecast so that you can look for that opportunity. As this is a program focusing on civil discourse, we hope that everybody participates tonight in that spirit. If you come up to ask a question at the microphone, please limit your time so that people will, be, will have time to ask questions and please resist repeating a question that's already been asked. Please hold your applause until the very end of the program. Will all of the elected officials, former elected officials, and candidates for elected office, please stand so that we might recognize you. Can we clap now? I think we have to break that rule already. <laughs> Thank you for your willingness to serve. We appreciate that. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Don Shelby, for the evening. Don Shelby has been a reporter and television anchor for 45 years. Before retiring from public journalism in 2010, he worked for 32 years as an anchor, investigative reporter, and environmental correspondent for WCCO-TV. He has won three National Emmy Awards the Columbia DuPont, the Scripps Howard, and the National Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. And he's twice won the Pulitzer Prize of Broadcasting, the George Foster Peabody Award. Since retirement, Don continues his work in, the, in environmental journalism, reporting for MinPost, the online daily, and he's a member of the Climate Science Rapid Response Team Roundtable. He's also an author, 
of The Season Never Ends, Wins, Losses, and the Wisdom of the Game, with a foreword by Tubby Smith. Please join me in welcoming Don Shelby. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's uh, always heartening to see so many people who care about the issues and care about our political process, who want to be a part of the conversation. That's one of the great things about the League of Women Voters and the organization, uh, to make sure that everyone is active and involved, uh, no matter what side of the aisle one happens to be. Uh, the important point is that we uh, know what we're talking about and we're concerned about this process. It might be a, a good point of departure to say this is a good time to be concerned about the process. Uh, we came up with this idea, not we, the League of Women Voters came up with the idea, that we wanted to talk about civil discourse and uh, collegiality and collaboration and partnership and teamwork in state government. But the headlines in the newspapers from late last night through today uh, show that something uh, has uh, gone wrong. And with the uh, comments by the governor after the uh, decision to, uh, to not confirm Ellen Anderson, a, a former senator and colleague of the people who voted for her uh, as the uh, chair of the PUC, uh, it has caused a rift that is going to take a long time to heal and how it manifests itself in politics and in what uh, has to be done in terms of state government, uh, I am not sure that uh, this is something that's going to be overcome very uh, quickly. Uh, no one could have planned that uh, this event would have occurred uh, contemporaneous with this discussion, but uh, uh, it's probably uh, right that uh, it happened in this way so that we don't have to uh, invent a story about mm. uh, the uh, sort of the dislocation of uh, feelings that happen to be uh, not going on in Minnesota, but going on across uh, the United States and in the halls of Congress. And so I think this is a discussion that should be held in every community in every state. Uh, and, uh, and elected officials and former elected officials should hear these uh, comments and discussions. And we hope that you will take part in the conversation. We've turned the microphone around for you. And at about uh, uh, eight ten or so, then we're going to open it up for questions for our panelists as well. And I'd like to introduce these panelists tonight. I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, uh, a name awfully familiar in the state of Minnesota for his, her legendary service. First elected in 1909, she served as Speaker of the House of the Minnesota State Legislature from 2007 to 2011. She is uh, only the second woman to ever hold that position of House Speaker and the first woman to earn party, uh, major party endorsement for a gubernatorial election for the state of Minnesota. Now, she is the president and CEO of Minnesota High Tech Association, and uh, that is an organization which I've had some familiarity, and it is a, a wonderful organization and made even better by her participation and by her leadership. Thank you. Glad to be with you tonight. Thanks. Stacy Defner uh, Hovey uh, is president of the League of Women Voters of Minnesota, and before taking that role of president, she spent 10 years on the state board as the uh, voter service chair and the first vice president. Ms. Defner Hovey also works at the University of Minnesota, where she is the director of the master's program in human resources and industrial relations at the Scar Carlson School of Management. Stacy Defner Hovey. Thank you very much. And our uh, next panelist is uh, Steve Swigum. He served in the Minnesota State Legislature for 29 years. He was first elected uh, to the Minnesota House of Representatives in 1978. He served as House Minority Leader from 1993 to 1998, and later as uh, Speaker of the House from 1999 to 2007. Now, during that time, he served on the Board of Directors of the uh, National Speakers Conference. He currently serves on the Board of Regents for the University of Minnesota and as the Executive Assistant and Communications Chief for the Minnesota Senate Republicans. And not a bad basketball player out of Kenyon, Minnesota. <laughs> Steve Swigum. You can applaud now. <laughs> now we can start in, uh, oh, 50 or 60,000 different places uh, to get the uh, ball rolling. 
But what I wanted to do, since we have such a fine audience tonight, is to include you and to ask you, uh, because of your participation, uh, to uh, participate in uh, listening to these uh, answers, because I'm going to try to represent you in this very first uh, question, and we'll go straight down the uh, line, starting with uh, Speaker Kelleher. Now, uh, the question is this. What role does a citizen play? What role can a citizen play in encouraging civil and productive dialogue among elected officials? Well, that is a great question to start off. Now, can I say it's just an honor to be sitting next to you as a kid growing up on the farm watching WCCO. <laughs> it was the only channel that came in on our farm. And so um, kind of a lifer on the WCCO thing. So it's great to be next to you tonight. And thank you for being willing to do this, this sort of public work as well. Well, citizens and constituents always play a critical role in the civil discourse because ultimately you are who elected officials have to come home to. And so if you are not happy with what the elected official is doing, believe me, uh, that, is, that is ultimately who we all answer to. I have to say that over the years of service, and I certainly did not serve as long as Steve served in the House, but the, the 12 years of service, I always, I always said the most interesting issue uh, that I heard about, I mean, I heard about a lot of issues during a legislative session, but the most interesting one, and I think you were speaker, I was in the minority, but there was work being done to curb methamphetamine production in Minnesota. So there was a pretty strict bill to curb the over-the-sale counter over-the-counter sale of things like Sudafed. And I remember we went home for our uh, Easter Passover break, and I did, as I did many days after session and during the break, I went to the grocery store. And I went to Lunds in Uptown, which is kind of on the edge of the district, and people started yelling at me in the store. Mm -hmm. Not kidding you. It was the only time this happened where someone actually yelled at me in a grocery store. And first it started in the produce mm -hmm. section, because that's where you first walk into. And some guy said, I hate that bill you're doing right now. And I thought, what is he talking about? Is he talking about some big, you know, awful thing? No. It, and it continued as I went throughout the store. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. I think you heard that, Mr. Speaker, from just about everyone who came back after that break. So, you know, it may not have been the most eloquent way that people express themselves, but I'll tell you, it got the message through. We went back and we changed it and we made it different. And so citizens always play a role in civil discourse because if you're unhappy, ultimately you have the ultimate, ultimate place and that's the vote. And the vote comes through. And so that's how people, you know, make the change. Um, now, I let me ask you about yeah. civil discourse. Well. <laughs> how, not just in, in not legislation. Not just discourse? Not just legislation, <laughs> how it affects legislation. Yeah. Why? How does it tame discourse into civility? Well, I'll tell you, um, I kind of always operate under three rules. The press rule, whatever I said, and therefore whatever my constituents heard could be reported in the press and that there was a sort of break on things that you might say then because of that because you know you don't want to sound um, uh, too harsh or mean or any of those things so the press rule then for me there there's always the golden rule and that is do unto others as you would want to have done unto you. And I think that that was also a very helpful rule. And for constituents, I often employed that rule, right? I mean, even if, even, you know, they most times were very civil. Sometimes when they weren't, I thought about how I needed to respond to the, the incivility. But most of the time, people were really civil. They employed that rule. Then the third rule is the mother rule, okay, Don? So this is Elaine. Donald, if you're going to talk to me like my mother. <laughs> no, I'm talking about my mother, Elaine, <laughs> who's going to be 88 next week. I never wanted to be in the position, and I think it, it, it was how I behaved with my constituents then, 
that I had to explain to my mother what I was doing because I'm telling you, she watched everything we did. And if I had to come home and she would say, why were you so cross with that person today? I would have to explain that to her. And, and you know, there's nothing like explaining something to your mother. So I tried to keep those three things in, in case. I think people generally do that when they're, re when they're saying something to their elected officials. I, I think that overall, I would say 99% of my interactions with my constituents were civil. I had one door knocking experience. I woke up two sleeping babies, twins. I got yelled at. Yeah. <laughs> I should have gotten yelled at. I was a mother myself, a young mother myself. I mean, I, I still feel badly. I passed that house and I still sort of duck in the car. So. That's Deputy Hovey. Well, I think that I would um, take it even kind of more personally than that. And since I have not served as an elected official as the two of you, nor in the, in the media, um, I think that the role that we all play as citizens is a very personal role. And that is that I, everybody, and myself included, has these, you know, visceral reactions to the things that we hear on, uh, that we see on TV or that we hear on the radio or we read in the newspaper. And there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, people out there talking about how we in the United States more and more are surrounding ourselves by people and by media and by um, what we want to hear is what we already believe. And I think that it is incumbent upon each of us to take a look at those people who we disagree with and try and figure out what it is, why they're coming at this from a different perspective. Because there aren't, you know, no one's an evil villain in their own mind, right? Everybody comes at this, their own perspective, because they, they honestly believe in things. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us personally to take that view of something before we decide that whatever it is that we're reading that makes us so angry is because that other person is unpatriotic or, or wrong, inherently wrong or they're trying to do evil or they're stupid or dumb or whatever, that we need to make sure that we're understanding that from their perspective, what they're saying is perfectly reasonable. And so it's a very personal thing for me that civil discourse starts with how we talk to each other, how we talk to our kids, how we talk around our kids. You know, I have two young kids, and when we talk around the dinner table, because we have dinner together almost every night, we talk about politics. And when we are talking about something and the kids go, well, how come that happened? We try very hard to explain our perspective and the other perspective, the best that we can. And that way the kids can make up their own mind. Now, of course, there are children, right? So they hear our perspective a lot more. So they're probably gonna agree with us more right now, but the reality is, is that they need to understand that just because we disagree doesn't mean that those other people are, are inherently evil people, because they're not. And so I think that you know, the, the role that all of us play is a very, very personal role. Um, and just like it's a very personal role to make sure that you go out and as you were saying, then vote and bring that to, to the people who are representing us as well. Speaker Swiggum. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Very you well. play a very mean basketball game yourself. <laughs> <laughs> very mean, by the way. His hands are always on you. He's pushing, he's shoving. Uh, I, um, I first of all, want to apologize to you for being a little late. I wanted to be here early enough to, uh, to mingle and, and speak to you. Um, but I'm not, I am a hayseed farmer, and you put me into the cities, and uh, I thought I knew where Old Shakopee Road was. <laughs> so I took off at the Mega Mall where Old Shakopee Road starts, and I thought it was 1800 Old Shakopee Road East is a municipal liquor store. <laughs> off sale, off sale. I kid you not, I was there. <laughs> I was there. It's right off, uh, right off Cedar, off uh, 77. It's uh, this side of the road. 1800 is a liquor store, and I thought, man, the League of Women Voters have changed since I was there. But I thought, 
I thought maybe I got a life or something. You know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, by the way, I'm kidding usually 95% of the time in, in my life. And I for, also want to acknowledge Ann Lincheski, our friend back here. There might have been others that I couldn't see when I didn't have my, gla I didn't have my glasses on. But uh, Ann, uh, thank you always for your kindness in the past and for your representation in, in your service. Um, civil discourse. Um, if I could, and I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this way. Uh, things always weren't so good in the old days, folks. You know, we think things are worse now, and I'm going to tell you a little bit later in some questions that things are worse now. But things weren't so good in the old days either. You know, the good old days weren't always the good old days. Uh, those of you who uh, have read about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson know that they were not necessarily civil to each other. Uh, those of you who read about Douglas and uh, Lincoln know that they were not necessarily civil to each other. Uh, we can go on throughout life, uh, throughout the history of our country, and, and there's always been significant confrontations that have taken place. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, civility uh, as we deal with, you, with, with, with each other um, wasn't always just in the good old days because the good old days were never as good as we think they were. Um, as I've tried to uh, deal with people, um, the one thing I've tried to bring out of folks when they, uh, they come and visit me, they come and talk to me, they uh, come to my room, is, is I try to put them in the chair of the other person, the other side of an issue. And, and I did that often. Now, whether it was a trick, whether it was what I would do, whether it was just my method, whether it was my ammo, whatever, uh, when folks would come in my office as a speaker, I would literally ask him to stand up and switch places with me from either my speaker's chair or maybe the other side of an advocacy issue that they were advocating. And, and all of a sudden, you see a little change in heart of people, a little change in their, uh, their tone uh, when you put them into a different chair. Not that you've convinced them, uh, not that you've said, well, maybe there needs to be some balance, some moderation in your position, but, but it does bring a different perspective. Um, I think uh, from a citizen involvement in, in uh, civility, uh, I would tell you your first action starts on uh, next week, Tuesday night, February 7th, precinct caucuses. Now, I don't know how many of you are going to go or not go, but I know less people go now than before and less people go than should. Um, <coughs> but you go to those precinct caucuses, folks? They're not going to be very civil. I guarantee you. I've been to Democratic precinct caucuses and I've been to Republican precinct caucuses. In rural Minnesota, they're all held in the same school building, so I would go to the Republicans once and speak a line. And since I was walking by the Democratic caucus, Don, I'd walk in there too. And <laughs> it was a way to keep my opposition away. Uninvited. <laughs> uninvited, yes, uninvited, but that never stopped me. Uh, uh, and at that precinct caucus, um, because so few people show up, so few, it'll be dominated by the more extreme um, philosophies on both sides of the aisle. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. You go to the, the, uh, uh, the Democratic Precinct Caucus, it's still going to be uh, that village idiot from down in Texas, you know, George W. Bush, and the uh, bad words that were said about him, about defoliate Bush, and all those things that you guys have heard and said. And, and the Republican caucus, it's going to be the socialist Obama, uh, you know, and the words that come with that. The more people that show up, use good people, the less extremism there will be that takes place. <coughs> and that moves forward. That moves forward to the people that you elect. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, tell you that involving citizens in that discourse on next uh, uh, Tuesday night is extremely important. I'm going to tell you that sitting in somebody else's chair is extremely important. Um, look at it from the other ladies or the other guys' view once in a while, and then you say to yourself, well, you know, maybe we have to find some uh, agreement, some compromise, some balance here, because you know, maybe I don't get everything the way I want. Maybe there is uh, some reasonability on both sides to, f to find common ground, to find balance on, on various issues. Well, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I want to uh, keep with you, and then we'll work back down, and then I'll start with uh, Stacey just a moment. Uh, 
on the third question. But is compromise really the goal of uh, the legislative process? Is compromise exactly what we are, are seeking? Uh, you're asking me first, yeah. Don? Um, I, I Can we just thank the Girl Scouts okay. before? Oh, That'll buy you a second. I, I don't think you seek compromise just for compromise sake. Just for compromise sake. That's not necessarily the reason you do it. Uh, if you do it just for compromise sake, you almost, you almost um, um, empower extreme positions from beginning. Um, take the bonding bill that's going to be up this legislative session. If you want to compromise, you know, the governor will start at a billion and the Republicans will start at 200 million. You'll start at ridiculous ends to compromise at five or 600 million, right? So, so I don't think compromise in itself is the goal. And I would also tell you compromise is not a bad word. Uh, there are those who feel advocates, passionate, give them their, I, I, I love passion. I think passion is very, very important. As long as you realize that sometime or another that passion leads to, uh, uh, to being able to uh, agree with somebody, bring people together, move them forward in the best interest of whether it be the city of Bloomington, the state of Minnesota, or the, or the country, at some time those decisions have to come together. Now, uh, whether it's cooperation, Don, whether it's compromise, whether it's find the right balance, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the right word is. I'm not one that think compromise is a bad word. I think it is actually part of the process. But, but, but I, don't, I wouldn't always tell you it is the goal that you have to begin with. If it does, that, that begs extremism and more radical positions. Stacy, a compromise sometimes is suggested uh, in this formula. One person says 2 plus 2 is 4. One person says 2 plus 2 is 6. And they compromise that 2 plus 2 is 5, and that's not right. <laughs> Some people come to the table at a compromise um, moment with the right answer. But they may have to compromise themselves off of the right answer, whether it's the Republican bringing the solution or the Democrat bringing the solution. So compromise to me, it seems, uh, sometimes carries us away from the right thing. Am I wrong? <laughs> I'm glad it's you. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> say, and, and yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to start by ever saying, Don Shelby, yes, you're wrong. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, um, no, I do hear what you're saying, and I think that's a, that's a good um, analogy uh, with, because I think we all can agree that, I'm not sure we all can agree, but I hope that we all can agree for <laughs> two plus two is not five. Um, and you know, I was thinking about what you were saying, and we think about even when um, you know, we've, we were putting this together or when we've been thinking about things, is, is compromise wrong in and of itself? Is partisanship wrong in and of itself? And, and, and yes and no. I think well, your point is well taken, that if you're striving, if you know that what you're going to have to do or what the goal is is to compromise, certainly you're going to, you are going to start far apart because you're hoping to make that compromise, the middle, actually closer to your side than the other. So, so you're going to start far apart. Um, and maybe the goal then should be um, coming to a solution that is going to work for the most people. That's going to work the best. We're not going to get this. We're not going to get this. So, or we're not going to get everything in here, and we're not going to get everything in here. So, what are the pieces that we can agree on, and what are the pieces that we can agree that we need to move forward on and keep discussing? And and maybe it's about talking through things. And sometimes, you know, I didn't, I haven't served, so I can't, I can't speak to what it's like to be on the political sides of of an issue, but. Um, Talking through things, a lot of times you can find your own, the, the group can find consensus, even if it's not what most people would consider compromise. They can say, okay, we come to consensus, we agree this is, this is what we're going to do, this is the best thing for the city, for the state, for the nation, for this group, for my family, for whatever you're talking about. 
And that maybe we didn't get everything, but we came to consensus that of all the things that we could have, these are the things that we think are the best ways to move forward. And so what, what I think happens is that people pick these words, partisanship, compromise, and they, they kind of demonize the word. And then it becomes difficult to even talk through the situation because people are using those words, well, you compromised, and, or there is no compromise. We will not compromise on this. Well, then, if you're anything besides those extremes you started with, you've failed to live up to what you said. And so I think that maybe we need to just take a step back from some of those, even some of the use of the words, and say, well, let's come to, to some understanding of how we can move forward and, and, and looking at it from a perspective of what's, what's the thing that we can all move forward on and start with that and then and then go from there you know I what is that common you, ground i couldn't agree with you more uh in in 45 years of covering politics uh the word that you don't hear very often is agreement why if you are in a uh a discussion where you you're coming from polar opposite positions that your goal is to try to reach an agreement not a compromise, mm -hmm. Hmm. because every know, everyone knows a compromise is not going to work. I negotiated salaries. Uh, uh, somebody had a figure in mind when uh, I was going in for a raise, and I had a figure in mind when I went in for a raise, and they were completely out, and we reached the middle, and, and uh, that's, where we sh were, that's what we both agreed on. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to invent a higher number, and he had to invent a lower number when we both knew this is what I was going to get paid. Why didn't we just walk in and say, all right, here's what I'm offering. Would you take that? And I go, yeah. And it's over. It's done. We've agreed. So I'm asking uh, you, uh, Speaker Anderson Kelleher, um, why do we start so far apart? Why, why, why isn't there in caucuses, why isn't there agreement uh, among the parties to say, look, let's cut six weeks of discussion out of this by really thinking hard about what our offer is going to be and, and, and alerting the governor that we're willing to do that. If he comes, we don't come in at 200 million and he doesn't come in at a billion. Maybe he comes in at, at 800 and then we come in at 400. We've got a lot less work to do. So let me start by saying, I think that there's a lot that's set up here that's right. I think there's also some big misunderstandings. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a contrary point of view. And that is that negotiation, the result of negotiations are not 50-50. The agreement is not 50-50. I, I think that in the days of negotiating internally within the caucus, uh, and remember, there are internal negotiations that go on as well. We could talk about that a lot. Sometimes the harder part was coming to agreement within intra-party negotiation to go forward with that offer. But rarely was the answer a 50-50 answer. And so I want us to kind of, you know, one of the other things I do in another part of my life is I teach a class called Managing Conflict at the Humphrey School, and I have for four years. Um, sometimes I even laugh at myself doing that, thinking, you know, uh, wow, this is interesting. Um, <laughs> But it's because I have taken a real interest, uh, uh, an interest in not just the practitioner side of negotiation, but also the art and science of it, studying it. And I had a great opportunity, I have to say a, a thank you to the Bush Foundation for funding a Bush Leadership Fellowship that I did in 2003 and 2005. And since this is going to be broadcast, I always have to say thank you to my husband who stayed home with two little kids <laughs> while I did this out in Boston. And um, I studied mediation and negotiation at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, at MIT Sloan, and at the Harvard Law School. And so in teaching this course, why I tell you this is, I think that you are right on to something, that the focus should be agreement. The focus should be where we get to. And we have to kind of get out of our head that that means uh, always a 50-50 split because the interest in what you're negotiating can be very different. I mean, I get to negotiate salaries as well now and make offers to people. And often I find that the salary, although important, is not as important as other things to people nowadays vacation time, time with their family, flexibility, 
the ability to do other things. Do you know that there's like a hundred things you can negotiate in a salary negotiation other than the salary? I mean, these are the things you have to be creative. And Steve was a very creative, I think a very creative negotiator and understood this very well, that you have to get down to what the interests are. And, you know, Governor Pawlenty, we certainly disagreed on a lot. But at the end of the day, there were certain things that he knew very well were not lines I could cross. I knew there were lines he could not cross. He knew there were lines that Senator Pogamiller could not cross. And we would acknowledge those in the room. You know, when you'd hear about these closed door meetings, the closed door meetings, when the closed door meetings, there comes a moment when everybody has to get real and say, you know what, I know you can't do that. I know you can't do that. But what we're gonna do instead is this. And it's often more creative. Um, but I also have to say the caveat that I agree. Steve, I felt like my dad was here for a second because my dad, you know, I had a love affair with Little House on the Prairie when I was a girl. What Minnesota girl doesn't? And I always be like, wow, if we could have just farmed with horses, which my father did start farming with horses when he was a kid, he used to say, you know, kid, there was nothing good about the good old days. <laughs> and I would be like, what is he talking about? You know, it all seems so romantic and wonderful. Well, it's true, you know, they didn't build the capital because everybody could get along. If all of you could get along and figure it out, we would not need places like the city hall chamber or the state capital, right? Because that is where when collectively as a society, when we can't settle our disputes or the courthouse, that is where we go. And sometimes we can't collectively or individually solve our problems that we have to solve collectively. One other thing I have to say. So just like this, doesn't this remind you a little bit of the house chamber? You know, there's two, you know, there's this aisle here. And I always, at my most frustrated moments, and Representative Lincheski knows about a lot of them. So if you want to know about them, you can ask her about those offline. But I would look out at the members serving, and it's a wonderful place to sit as speaker, isn't it? It's a beautiful place. You get to see the view is amazing. You get to see everything that everybody's doing. You know who's talking you got to the who. Gavel too. And you got the gavel. <laughs> got the gavel. But what I would always look at, and I would try to remind myself is, as heated as it would get, people come to serve, they are more alike than different when they come to serve. They really come to serve out of the interest of wanting to serve people and the things that they care about or their community cares about. And that was one of the things that kept me always grounded and hopeful that we could get to that agreement because people don't come to take the grenade pin out and throw it. That's not why they come. That happens in other places, but it, it's not here. Okay. All right, uh, Stacy, um, my good friend, uh, Speaker Swiggum, uh, brings up history and he bring and, and you and I were talking about history just before uh, this in, entire thing started and and uh, and mentioned that it was tough during the Jefferson Adams uh, period of time and they were using a lot of uh, back channel means to try to uh, disrupt each other's campaigns and uh, republicanism and federalism was uh, it was a, a big issue in the land and it was an either all or kind of thing. It was not, you could not compromise between federalism and republicanism. Now, uh, it's interesting though, and this is not a criticism, you point out that it was bad at that time. But I am not prepared to say, to go to the worst of us and say, that's the way we are today. Because I also remember, and you remember, in the United States Senate, Edward Dirksen, you remember uh, some of the uh, incredible uh, people who worked uh, in times of trial across the aisle in a collaborative teamwork fashion to do the best thing for the United States. And they had to, they had to compromise not with the opposition, they had to compromise with themselves. They had to say, I'm, I am willing personally to give this up in order to get this so that we can move the country forward. So there have been exceptional periods of time in our history where we worked collaboratively, collaboratively and we worked as a team on the same team, uh, a guard and a forward, Democrats and Republicans, but we're all on the same team. We're all on the Minnesota team 
trying to do the best for the state of Minnesota and its people. So why, why do we, why can't we say, Stacy, let's mirror the best of it. Let's find out what we did best, how we were the most collaborative, how we were the most uh, together in our, uh, in our goals of reaching the best possible conclusions for the people of Minnesota, instead of trying to make sure our opinions win out. Do you notice that I always get the questions where he has this really long explanation <laughs> first? <laughs> um, but um, I think that I think that the the simple answer to your question is that for the vast majority of people, we actually do. And I think what we see in the newspaper or we see on television or we hear on the radio is all the times that that people aren't looking for the best, that they're looking for the worst. Because if, if all of us were out there looking for the worst in our neighbors or looking for the bad things that are going on or how we don't get along, nothing would ever get done. And so I think what, what we need to, to do as, as people and we need to encourage in our, own, in our own media and in our elected representatives is that we need to make sure that we offer up our own examples of when we are doing our best. And I think about, you know, in my own town, um, where we've had a very divisive school board, three and four very, very different opinions about what should happen with the school district. And, and there were still times when even when the newspaper um, editorials were, were very harsh against each other, there were still votes that were together. They, and I'm not sure that there was ever seven to zero, <laughs> but six to one or five to two or something like that, that, that where people were, were working together to, to do things. And, and, as I, and I noticed in the, um, in the elections and the times running up to it, people were like, well, they'll never agree, et cetera. And, and this is gonna seem self-serving, but the League of Women Voters came out and did a school board forum. And at that forum, those, I think there were nine or 10 candidates at that point, they all talked together and they talked about what they thought should happen with the school district. And they had not agreement, not compromise, not even necessarily consensus, but they, they were there in civil discourse and they, they talked about what they thought should happen. And people were able to hear that and were able to take that and, and make an educated and understandable vote based on what they had heard from that forum as opposed to the snipping back and forth and back and forth in the paper. And people talked about that forum and they talked about how, you know, I really liked the fact that we could hear from what they wanted on the issues and it wasn't just he said, she said, he said, she said. So I think it is there and I think people do look for the best and look for when we can work together. But I think what maybe is more sexy and plays better is, is when people are mean to each other. And I think that we as citizens need to hold anyone that we can who's, who's looking at that meanness and being excited about that and say, okay, you know, we need to think about other things. I think about the show, show Survivor and I've, I've never liked the show Survivor because it's all about who can be meanest <coughs> on a desert island. And I'm like, you know, if you 12 people were on a desert island, I'm pretty sure you'd be working together <laughs> because otherwise you're all going to die. <laughs> But the whole show, the whole premise of the show is how can we be really mean to each other so I win? So I've never watched the show. I, it, it just, I want to see the show that's, we survive, you know, like really put them on a desert island and see how they build a society. That's what I want to watch. And I think that, so the answer to maybe my long-winded answer to your question is, I think that it's there. I think that we just choose not to look for it. And I think we really need to make sure that we're looking for those times when, when people are working together. Because if everybody's as unpatriotic and, and 
against the country, as, those other, as the other side says, then nothing would ever happen and, and we really wouldn't have anything going on in the country. And that's clearly not happening. So, you know, we just need to look for the good that's there. I think it is. I think people do it all the time, but we just choose to look at the, the mean stuff instead. Speaker Swigum, uh, Speaker um, Anderson Kelleher brought up uh, conflict resolution and I'm not sure that everybody who uh, runs for office and is elected and finds themselves in the state legislature uh, is skilled at conflict resolution. Um, and if I were the uh, boss, I would probably make everybody go to school for on, <laughs> on just that subject to figure out how to resolve conflicts. Now here's the elephant in the room, Steve. The uh, elephant in the room is a remarkable thing happened yesterday. And uh, the Republicans uh, unilaterally cut the, the budget of the Democrat staff and they take a long uh, and respected, long serving and respected member of the, the Senate body and uh, do not confirm the position as chair of the Public Utilities Commission in Ellen Anderson. The governor jumped out of his skin. Um, and Democrats have vowed reprisals. Uh, you are uh, the communications man point for uh, the Senate uh, at this point in your life. Make that sound right to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take it back. That was not, <laughs> I don't have the hardest question. Uh, thank you, I think. Um, um, Donna, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question, and I'm going to answer it very directly so you can all hear the Paul Harvey other side of the story. Because you folks know, you're wise enough to know, there's always the other side of the story. Um, but, I, but I first want to, if I could, uh, Don talked about the, uh, the best interest in the team. A and I, I might sound hokey. It might sound kooky. But I actually believe it. Folks, I believe in my heart. I ran my caucus this way. Once in a while, they'd throw me up against the wall. <laughs> You've been there, Margaret. You've been in there. You come in from a negotiation, and you did what? And all of a sudden, you're up against the wall. Uh, but I believe, very honestly, whether you're a caucus, whether you're a party, whether you're a uh, legislature, whether you're a Congress, or whether you're a state, Don, I believe it operates and can operate as a team. And in that, you do, you do two things. And, and I preach to my caucus all the time about this. You, you recognize that there's differences of abilities and talents, visions, ideas of what should be done for the state. You recognize that. That's up front. I mean, some block, some rebound, some shoot, some defend. Right, Don? But then the key is, after that recognition and that respect, you've got to hope and work for each other's success. Now, if you do that, you're a pretty good basketball team. If you do that, you're a pretty good caucus. If you do that, you can be a pretty good legislature. If you do that, you can be a pretty good Minnesota. And, and, and generally speaking, I agree with Stacy. Generally speaking, I think that things do work out in the end the way they're supposed to. A little tough times in between, but generally they do work out the way they're supposed to. Uh, let me get to the, uh, the news of yesterday. I first need to give a little disclaimer. Um, there's been a couple of things that were set in motion before I became uh, the media communicator or director for the caucus. As you would guess, things don't happen overnight. Uh, so there were some things that maybe were set in motion, in fact, including uh, our colleague, uh, Ann, uh, Margaret, our colleague uh, who was not confirmed yesterday. Um, um, I want to. I, I I think that I n I need to uh, to tell you this. And the senator did, or the governor did, come off the wall. Uh, the first thing you need to ask the governor is when he was United States senator. How many times did he not confirm appointments by George W. Bush? Lots, folks. Lots. And all of a sudden, the governor comes unglued. I underst I understand him being upset. But go back to his previous service in six years in the, in the United States Senate and ask him how many tens of times, whether it was the Supreme Court or whether it was other appointments, he didn't, he didn't confirm George W. Bush's appointees. 
that's sitting in the other chair, the way I mentioned that we, uh, I, uh, a, a tactic I use. Uh, secondly, there is no question uh, that the personality of the, uh, of the former senator that was not confirmed was not at question. Uh, the personality of the person was not at question. But the Constitution, the Constitution gives the responsibility to the Senate to confirm appointments. And generally, they are to be confirmed in the best interests of the state of Minnesota. Now, by any measure, by any measure, if you look at bills that have been introduced by the former senator, if you look at votes or legislation that was passed by the former senator, um, if you, if you uh, look at ratings, all of you guys give us ratings. <coughs> I mean, sometimes the League of Women Voters gives us ratings, sometimes it's Child Works Now, sometimes it's the Chamber of Commerce, sometimes it's the Sierra Club. But when you give us ratings, uh, you know, whether they're right or wrong, Don, you look at those ratings, and the former senator that did not get confirmed, you know, had an advocacy. There is no doubt about it. In this quasi-judicial spot, much different than a commissioner of economic development, or much different than a commissioner of transportation. In this spot of quasi-judicial spot at, at PUC, you cannot have an advocate there. You should not have an advocate there. Should not. Uh, and there was concern amongst the senators, and my employers right now, so I'm asking you to look in the other, uh, uh, from the other seat, that, that, that uh, former Senator Anderson, uh, not the person, but the positions that she had taken were not in the best interest of balance for the rate payers and for the job producers for the jobs in Minnesota, point blank. Um, now, that is the position they took. Actually, you know, on the non-confirmation if it was going to be done should have been done last year when she was appointed. Uh, but uh, honestly, the governor asked for time. They were going to not confirm last year. The governor asked for time. And this year came, and uh, the question got to be, well, what did the time bring us? You know, what changed? And, uh, and actually, nothing did. So uh, that took place. In the Senate budget, which was a story the day before, again, probably set in motion from, uh, from a year ago. Um, but here's, here's basically uh, what took place. Uh, there was a flip, as you know, in majority in the uh, Senate between Republican and Democratic in the 2010 elections. Um, at that time, the majority, who happened to be the Republicans, actually cut 14, 14 permanent positions from the majority staff, albeit by reducing the number of, uh, basically they reduced the number of committees that, that uh, the Senate had. So if you re reduce the number of committees, you probably don't need as many committee administrators, you don't need as committee, a number of uh, committee legislative assistants. Fair enough. But they did reduce by 14 the number of permanent positions uh, that, the, uh, that, the, that the Senate majority prior to them had had, again, because they cut a number of, uh, of, uh, of committees. Um, there should have probably been some reduction to the minority staff at that time. There was not from the permanent staff. They took it all out of the majority staff, the, the permanent reductions. So you got to go, but you got to put in a little perspective at that point. Um, then you come to the action this year. Uh, we all know that the uh, legislature, uh, House 2 and, had to cut uh, budgets by about 5% uh, because of the budget balancing agreement of last year. Very, very appropriate. If you're going to ask the DNR to cut 5%, if you're going to ask labor and industry to cut 5%, you better be willing to cut 5% yourself. So the House and Senate both had to, had to reduce their budgets uh, by 5%. Uh, and in the discussions, uh, in the dollars that came uh, forward at that time, uh, it was partially in recognition of the non-permanent reductions that the minority took last year, uh, and partially in recognition of the fact that the majority was going to take temporary reductions of 12 persons for this biennium, um, uh, there was uh, a number that was given to the minority, and this is a Democratic minority, a number was given and asked them to balance their budget within that number. I think it was 1.6, maybe it was 2.67 million, something like that. In all honesty, in all fairness, 
the minority has a number of comparable positions to the mi ma majority that are paid at higher rates, higher reimbursements. Some of it due to the fact, some of it due to the fact that they've been there in the majority for a, quite a long period of time. So you have uh, LAs comparable in the minority making a lot more than LAs comparable in the majority. Same is true with other positions, and some of it due to longevity. Uh, but uh, what the uh, Senate decided to do, the Senate Rules Committee, was say, give them a budget, manage it within that budget. Now, could it have been done better? Probably. I'm not saying it couldn't. Has there been an outreach made to the Senate minority to say, you know, can, should we be looking at this more fair? The outreach has been made, and it has been done the talking. But, but there's always other sides of the story that you need to, to consider when you look at uh, you know, what took place in the news today. Ask Governor Dayton <coughs> if he confirmed every one of George W. Bush's appointees. Ask him. Let me ask uh, Speaker Anderson Kelleher um, her take on this issue. And let me remind you of the only uh, senator who spoke on this issue on the floor was Senator Julie Rosen, Republican, who had uh, co-authored bills with Ellen Anderson, uh, and they had worked collegially in getting things passed. Much of the uh, environmental energy picture that uh, is operating this law now in the, in the state of Minnesota was authored by uh, Ellen Anderson. Uh, there is uh, no question that she advocated for renewable energy. There is no question about that. There is no evidence she, she have ever advocated uh, for higher uh, tax rates or higher rates for uh, rate payers. Um, and in the voting that the PUC, since she has been in that position, she voted uh, almost always with the uh, mainstream Republican, Republican majority of the PUC, the uh, other positions. Uh, Julie Rosen uh, said that she was an extremist. <coughs> And she said she based her position on the fact that she had heard from so many people in the utility community. She didn't say she'd heard from the people. She said she heard from the utility people that they didn't want Ellen Anderson as the chairman of the U uh, PUC. That stinks. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, if you are listening only to a public interest, only to one group of people, that doesn't sound like uh, a smart thing to say for a senator on the floor of the Senate. Well, I need to start by saying I have a lot of respect for Julie Rosen and have worked with her a number of times over the years. So I think that she is a very smart person. Um, I think that if I'm hearing between what Steve is saying, there were things in motion uh, for a while here that maybe no one could stop at this point. But I do think it needs to be pointed out that when Senator Anderson was appointed, another Democrat was taken off the PUC, um, Representative Tom Pugh, who actually uh, I think served as Ann and my minority leader when we were first in the House. And so it is a little bit of a curious situation because I know that there, there's a majority, I mean, if you were doing this by a partisan basis, you'd say there is a majority in the PUC of people who would have put R behind their name. They would have identified as a Republican, all those things. So it is a bit curious and the previous appointees like Leroy Kopendreyer, Betsy Worgen, all former senators um, were Republican senators. So this, this notion that you can't have done a job that required advocacy and then go to a quasi-judicial role or judicial role smacks in the face of our history in the state of Minnesota. I mean, I think the League of Women Voters knows that very well. There are many, many examples of people, Democrats, Republicans, independents, who go on to be appointed to be judges in uh, the administrative law judge function. I know that uh, there are a number of former House members that we've served with that are in those roles. So I don't buy that. Um, I will say that I don't know that we'll ever know totally what happened here. 
I think that you have identified some of the things that people will probably scratch their head about for a long time. It's unfortunate that, that people did not come forward in that hearing last spring and publicly voice their concerns. Because in my reading of the record here, there were some, there were sort of things surmised, these, you know, the voting records, all those things. We each have those things when you serve in public office. You have these ratings that people come up with and they pick out the vote where you most agree with them or they vote, pick out the vote where you least agree with them and then they score you on those. And sometimes we all run around and say, I got 100%. You know, I think today I have a Nature Conservancy uh, notebook. I guess I, you know, I mean, you know, it's just what happens. Um, I think it's unfortunate. And I will say, from a perspective of not being there today, it's not my deal. I served in the House, so I have never been through one of these confirmation hearings. Um, I think Ellen Anderson is a really, really bright public servant who ended up on the wrong side of a whole bunch of things here. And I hope someday we know, I hope someday 20 years from now somebody tells us what all those issues were, not just what we're hearing today, because I suspect there were other things. Now I will also say, Governor Pawlenty was mad when uh, Lieutenant Governor Molnow was rejected as the Transportation Commissioner. He was very angry about um, former Commissioner Sharon Pier Sherry Pearson Yucky, as, as these governors should be. These are their appointees. These are their choices. This is a poke in their eye, or that's what they feel like at the time. So I think Governor Pawlenty and Governor Dayton both have felt this. And we shouldn't be surprised by that reaction. That's a strong reaction. I don't think it's maybe how any of us would have reacted or things we would have said. But I'm not surprised by a strong reaction on this one. Partly because I know Ellen Anderson. I know how smart Ellen Anderson is. I was speaker when the Renewable Energy Standard passed. It passed bipartisanly with a very small number of people voting opposed to it. It was seen as nation leading. It was seen as the forefront of our new economy, which it's been. Many of the people who join my organization today are in this new economy. And I don't think there's anything, I think it's very mainstream Minnesotan what Ellen Anderson's record had been about. I think whatever this was truly about, I hope we'll find out someday. Stacy, let me. Uh, ask you uh, from the position at the Carlson School as well as the League of Women Voters. It seems to me the Supreme Court of the United States is made up of conservative and liberals. They may not, they may recuse themselves if they advocate for uh, a, a certain railroad that comes before them on certiorari, but in most cases they don't recuse themselves, they bring to the table uh, in the discussions about how uh, a certain case is going to be ruled upon, uh, their perspectives. So should, the re should this be a, in essence, a Republican-controlled PUC that will, according to Julie Rosen, listen to the utility companies? Is there not a place for a person who has an opinion about a different way to approach the future of energy in the United States and in the state of Minnesota on the PUC, serving in a, a quasi-judicial role, not as an advocate, but bringing different thoughts to the matter? Well, I can, I, I can, I, or I, I am choosing to speak as from the League of Women Voters, but considering that I work at the University of Minnesota and um, a member of the Board of Regents is sitting next to me, I'm going to just go with the League of Women Voters and, <laughs> and uh, not speak from my boss's 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 boss who's sitting right here. So, um, uh, That's but I think very that, judicious thank of you. you. Was, thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, but I do think you have a good, I mean, the, if I'm, if I'm surmising correctly, what you're asking really is, is it okay to bring your stuff to the table? And no matter what that table is, whether it's the Supreme Court of the United States, whether it's the, the House or the Senate or, or the City Council or your family or whatever. And I think that absolutely. I think that the way that this country was founded was founded on 
checks and balances. And I think that's, that's vital to the way that the country has worked so far. It's a pretty good experiment that we're in. Um, and I think that you, to, to pretend that you don't have a background, that you don't have individual opinions, that you don't have um, a culture and a history and things that you bring with you is, is unrealistic. Because none of us work that way. And just because you sit behind a media desk or you sit behind a desk in a courtroom, you, you still bring all of that with you because we don't want you to lose what makes you human. I think that to say from any side of any aisle that people cannot, because they have an opinion, they cannot then possibly see the other side, sit in someone else's chair, and be able to rule in a way that is, in their opinion, the best, the best interests of what they're supposed to be ruling on, whether it agrees with what they're doing or not. There are many times when the Supreme Court will sit down and people will say, oh, well, we can just pick how this is going to go. There's going to go four on this side and five on this side, and they're never, and you know, it doesn't turn out that way. Because they look at the law and they look at what they're supposed to and they say, you know, I'm bringing my humanity here and, and I think this is what we should rule. And sometimes people say it went just what they brought their humanity with, but that's the reason why we have a Supreme Court and a presidency or an executive and a legislature. And it's supposed to be like that. And I do think that people can bring their own um, advocacy, their own self to the jobs that they do. And we have ways, if, if the people, you know, if, if, uh, if El I was going to say if Ellen Anderson, but let just even to take it away from that, if, if someone is in a position and they are clearly acting outside of the realms of what is, is the people who can, if Ellen Anderson goes off the deep end and does crazy things, there are ways to get rid of her. <laughs> but until she does that, I think we need to allow that to move forward, even if we don't necessarily agree with everything she's doing. We have a system of checks and balances that we can use. If you look at Wisconsin, there are people who are out there looking at whether they're going to recall the governor or not recall the governor. That's a system. Everybody has maybe have their opinions about the system too, but you know, it's a way to, to make your point heard if you don't like what happens. And I think that we have to allow for the fact that whether the recall happens or not, whether Ellen Anderson gets confirmed or not, I mean, she didn't, but if she, you know, we have to allow the system to also work. You can recall or you can have the election when Walker's up again in Wisconsin and maybe he'll be tossed out then or maybe he won't be, maybe he'll be confirmed and that's okay because that's what the people wanted. And I think that to, to but to try and pretend that judges or quasi-judicial or any of us come without our history is to, is to make us into something that we're not. we're not. We're not robots, we're human. And we have to be upfront about that first. And then go from there and, and, and use the system and its checks and balances to make sure that we were in agreement as a, as a unit moving forward for the state. Speaker Swigum, I'm going to let you wrap up this part before we um, uh, enter into the uh, question and answer uh, process with the uh, people in the attendance tonight. And because you are still involved in uh, the, uh, at the State House and, and uh, have now taken over communications, uh, a lot of this is going to fall on you to uh, not only explain to the public, but to explain to uh, other people in the state legislature, uh, how you can move forward from this point. Uh, I would not want your job right now because this is going to be a tough one because you're going to have to untie the Gordian knot and it is cinched down tight right now. How are you going to do it? The process worked as it was supposed to. The process did work. Even long party lines. 
uh, well, that's both sides. I mean, party lines both ways, you know. But does, the, does that mean that um, if it changes, if parties in control change, then they have the right to do exactly the same thing in retribution for what was done to them before? Um, there was, uh, Don, I can tell you very, very honestly, and I will tell everybody here, that the vote yesterday was not a retribution vote. That never, ever came up. However, if it, you want to consider that, when an awesome, talented, very, very intelligent commissioner, Ms. Yucky, I think from North Carolina or wherever she was from, uh, South Carolina, was not confirmed uh, three years ago, maybe, four years ago, four years ago, you did not see Governor Plenty react that way in a very uncivil way. When Carol Molnar was not confirmed as Transportation Commissioner, you did not see Governor Plenty react in that same way. And he was able to move ahead and move ahead in the best interest of the state. A couple of things that need to be clarified. Uh, uh, first of all, Don, you mentioned um, that there would be a Republican PUC. I, that's not possible, folks. The PUC is a quasi-judicial body that is balanced from its makeup. I think, and Speaker, help me, I think the law says no more than two from each party. Is that what it says? I don't know, Steve. I, I think, in fact, it was Republican Tim Pawlenty. Representative Slocum's in the audience. Is it, she's on, uh, I think she knows that. Is Representative Slocum here? I, way back there. I, I, think, I think the law says no more than two from each party, and then one. I believe it says that, no more than two from each party. So it cannot end up to be four Republicans or four Democrats or anything like that on, on the board. So, so I, and I think there has to be an independent. And if you remember correctly, it was Governor Pawlenty that appointed Democrat Minority Leader Tom Pugh uh, to the board in, 19, or in 2003, was, maybe. I mean, he needed to fill the slot, too. With a Democrat. Right. With a Democrat, right? Right. And that's why I think, I think the law does say that no more than two from each party. I, I, that's what my memory tells me. Um, and, and, and one other point that I need to make is that it was true that since uh, 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 um, uh, Senator Anderson has been appointed as PUC, there were uh, 221 votes and 206 of them were unanimous. That means nothing, folks. That means nothing. In the House and in the Senate, and 90% of the votes are unanimous, are they not? 90% of the votes are unanimous. So whether it's 206 or 205 out of 220, that really doesn't speak to the differences that do exist or the lack of balance or the balance that did exist. It, does, it doesn't speak to it. Um, and, and, and then the, the last thing I, I would say um, is, is that, uh, and, and this was, I think was Stacy uh, was mentioning about, about the check uh, that's involved in the Constitution. And, and the Senate is given the authority in the Constitution to confirm appointments by the governor. That's a, that, that, that's a, a, a responsibility given to the Senate, hopefully acting in the best interest of Minnesota, hopefully doing that. In this case, I would argue act, acting in the best case of jobs and of ratepayers. I, I would argue that. But, but even if somebody were to argue something different, which I fully, fully accept, there probably was a concern among some that once confirmed, there is no check, Stacy. There is no check. There is no way to remove a PUC commissioner after confirmation. So once confirmed, there would be no check there. If there, you mentioned about the checks and balances. So I, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things that you know, might be of interest to people who wanted to be uh, students of the, uh, uh, of the process with, with, with facts. So the final thing, though, Steve, is, is yeah. just how do you plan to heal the division? <sighs> well, I, uh, Don, with, without question, uh, there is bad feelings at the legislature, without question. You know, I, again, let me say Tim Pawlenty got over it. 
George W. Bush got over Mark Dayton, not confirming many of his appointments. Those people rose to the higher standard above it. I'm trusting that the governor will be able to do it too. But my job, I guess, is, quote, the face of the Senate, and that's not probably a very good thing to be saying because this isn't necessarily a face you want to put out uh, uh, to the people. But my job, my, my background, my history, I I'm generally not a confrontational person. I, I confront pretty good when somebody confronts me. But I don't confront by nature. That's, that's not my nature. I try to bring people together. So what I try to do is to reach out to folks as we're doing uh, maybe to Senator Bach, the minority leader in relationship to the Senate budget. Uh, those overtures have been made. Uh, uh, other issues, uh, you know, the non-confirmation is going to be a tough one because, you know, that, you know, it's yes or no. You know, it's not a, something you can find common ground or a compromise on. Don. That, that's, that's a tough one. But I'm going to assume that the governors uh, will put up another uh, appointee. Um, um, very interesting when uh, Governor Plant. God help that person, huh? <laughs> in this. Well, no, no. I, you know, I, I mean, I don't who wants to do this anymore? <laughs> well, uh, folks, I was a commissioner of Governor Plenty's. I never got confirmed. Never got confirmed. I was unanimously confirmed by the uh, Jobs Committee of, G of uh, Senator Jim Metzen. Unanimously confirmed. But the majority leader at that time. And I had had, you know, a few give and takes when we were negotiating budgets, and uh, um, uh, he never decided to bring my confirmation up to the Senate floor uh, because he probably knew I had the votes to to be confirmed, and he didn't want that to happen. So you sit in front of here, in front of you, an exact example of maybe something that wasn't civil, Don, in the past. The Democratic majority leader did not bring up my confirmation for three over three and a half years. Maybe he was being kind to you, Steve, though. Maybe he thought you weren't going to, I mean, I don't know, but. I think I, think I had the votes because I was unanimously supported <laughs> by the committee. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the other thing here is in this situation, all these people could serve without having a confirmation vote. And that, that might have been a way through this, but instead there was a different path taken. Mm -hmm. All right, now let me open up the uh, floor for questions. The microphone is right here. Uh, everyone is free to uh, step up. Just walk right up to the microphone and ask your question of any or all of the panel. Okay. And identify yourself, please, because we're on television. My name is Ben, Ben Kiriagis. I'm a business owner from Plymouth, Minnesota. And I want to ask a question about the media, the role of the media. And uh, I want to start with a uh, sports analogy because uh, they usually call politics uh, contact sport these <laughs> days. <laughs> so I'd like you to consider being in a professional football game, and there's a big play, and the ref calls a penalty of some sort, and he gets on his PA and he says, this side claims it's a penalty, this side claims it is not, you decide. And unfortunately, the media these days pretty much does that, you know, to the point where sometimes you take a media person to a math class and they'll say, math teacher claims two and two equals four. The administration wants to do a study. So what is the proper role of the media? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And it, it is, uh, uh, you've, you've basically written the first chapter of the book that I'm currently working on called <laughs> The Failure of American Journalism. And it fails just because of that. It, it fails exactly because of that. The New York Times just uh, in their blog space uh, ask readers whether reporters should identify wrong statements made by politicians, for instance. So if someone says that uh, President Obama is a socialist who uh, intends to, who hates work and intends to, and you hear these statements and they're rolled out. Uh, is there a role and a responsibility as part of the reporter to know the facts? Well, that requires investigation and requires time. The current economic model for uh, journalism uh, as seen on television and in uh, the printed press is mature and failing. And there are not uh, enough reporters, and there's not enough time 
uh, currently do. I'm not making excuses. I'm saying this is a failing. Not enough time to do that. They're not trained well enough. They don't know the facts well enough. Um, and if you, if you watch television news today, as I watch television news, if you can come up with 10% uh, that's actually the news, uh, I'll be really surprised. And now you know why I'm retired. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and so, yes, uh, the uh, he said, she said, you decide is terrible. And it's particularly, I might, uh, to not my own horn, but I, I might trumpet my own cause, it's uh, particularly true in global warming. Uh, there is no debate. There is no debate in science. None whatsoever. There is no other cause. Nevertheless, reporters who are gone, going out to try to talk about global warming, who have never covered it before, who have no science background whatsoever, have never re read the reports, don't know any of the scientists, uh, are bound when they hear a person come to town and say, there is global warming, the first instinct according to the journalism construct is to go out and find someone who disagrees. Now, that, and they give them 30 seconds each. <laughs> um, but the one who says there is global warming is represented by 98% of all published peer-reviewed science. Uh, the one who is speaking represents only 1% because the 2% of the 97, 98, 2% actually agree that there is global warming. They just disagree on the sensitivity of the Earth's climate um, and its human cost. And 1% says it's a hoax. So you talk that 1%. So what I'm telling you is 97, 98, 99, and 1. So really you should give 99 seconds to the person who says there is and 1 second to the person who says there isn't, and that would be balance. <laughs> but we can't, we, we don't know um, what happened with Ellen Anderson, for instance. I've learned a lot from, from Speaker Swiggum today about what happened, um, and, there, and it's a new take, and it, and it puts a different color on what happened. Uh, people jump to conclusions, they're shorthanded, uh, and there are still some uh, State House uh, reporters who, who uh, cover what goes on there, and they can be listened to. They can be listened to. Eric Escalo was one. Pat Kessler is another one that I will speak of who know what they're talking about. Um, but they're not going to know everything. But I agree with you completely that we, we make no headway whatsoever in journalism when we say, this person says this, this person says this, you be the judge. You've, done, you've, you've not kicked the can down the road in terms of knowledge at all. And it's a failure and journalism is failing it. And so it's up to you. It's up to you to find the information because if you read broadly, the information is out there. You'll find the answers, but it's not going to come to you on your doorstep or in the six o'clock news. So I, you know, I think that that's a good segue to citizen journalism. And there's some really amazing things happening out there that are citizen movement based, both conservative and more liberal that are following the story that do more in-depth things but i do have to say that after the the failure to confirm i was working away and then i uh turned on twitter which i like watching and i sort of use it as my news aggregator and people were saying really awful things on both sides yesterday uh staffers uh probably on both sides were saying really awful things about the members uh, there was all sorts of really inflamed stuff, and this happens every day on Twitter. You know, it's down to 140 characters, Don. You can, you know, say you have to be really inflammatory to get your tweet read or forwarded or whatever. And I wanted to, I really thought about saying, put the device down, everybody. Just put the device down. You know, this is like a moment when you just should put the device down. And a lot of people don't, they, either they want the attention so badly that they just keep saying inflammatory stuff. And this can go for both sides. Go, it can go for multiple sides of partisan view. Or they want to be noticed and they want to say things. And, you know, it happened in December when I think, you know, a really, a really personal tragedy happened at the Capitol that I think a lot of people have to say that political people are human too. And things happen. But you don't have to go out and say horrible things about 
other people when something like that happens. Right? Mod- mod- that ha- needs to be stopped. I mean, but that's self-control and that's self-discipline. Yeah. And sometimes that's people who are people's bosses needing to say to them, you need to stop it. I know what I would have done as, as speaker had one of my communications staff gone out and done some of these things or said some of these things. I would have said, you get a warning and this is going in your file. And if you do it again, then you're going to be dismissed. Bravo. Social media uh, is not moderated. No. Uh, comments sometimes to uh, newspapers are moderated based on uh, certain uh, strictures regarding um, taste and, and how one communicates. And so it, it, it keeps the, the conversation a little bit more civil. But uh, social media is not. No. Now, I'm going to say something to you that, uh, that I can say now after 45 years that will surprise you. The least important thing to me in the world is your opinion. <laughs> I, do, I do not care about anybody's opinion. That was not true of the elected people up there. <laughs> I do not care about your opinion. I don't care about your opinion. Oh, good, you said that, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what I do care about is your informed opinion. Oh. Good. Good clarification. An opinion is ideology based, belief, notional, how you feel when you get up in the morning. Uh, what you think based on your limited amount of information. I had a daughter who, uh, Ashley, who uh, Steve knows really well. Um, she graduated from uh, Columbia with a master's degree. She's an author, but she was uh, 13 at the time, and, and uh, something big had happened in the news, and uh, she said, I have an opinion about that. And she uh, told me her opinion, and she said, uh, what do you think of that opinion? And I said, it stinks. <laughs> and she said, you can't say that to me because I'm studying the Constitution and social studies and uh, uh, the Constitution says uh, everybody, everybody's opinion has to be respected. And I said, you didn't read that close enough. It says you have a right to hold your own opinion, but it doesn't have to be respected. And in fact, here's what you don't like about the Constitution, I'm going to tell you. Uh, that part about the Constitution says everybody has a right to their opinion? She said, yes. I said, uh, protects my right to my opinion that your opinion stinks. <laughs> and she said, well, what, what use is the Constitution? <laughs> I said, you're not the person who never said that. So um, I said, but here's 12 uh, things to read, three books and a bunch of websites and things you can go to. Read that, come back with another opinion. She came back and she said, uh, all right, I've got another opinion about three weeks later after she'd studied. And, and she said, uh, what do you think of that opinion? I said, well, it doesn't suck as bad, <laughs> um, but I love it and I respect it because you took the time to try to learn and you tried to, and it, and it changed. Your opinion over here is different than your opinion since you've read. So um, there's too many opinions going on out there right now, too many unbased un, uh, opinions. Uh, based only in ideology, <clears throat> not based in knowledge. And so it is your responsibility. I'd like to say it was my responsibility to make you smart, but uh, really my, the news hole, I only had uh, maybe 18 minutes to tell you everything in the world that you should know, um, including Charlie Sheen. <laughs> and uh, it couldn't be done, and it was frustrating. It was terribly frustrating. And the, more, and the more Charlie Sheen and, and Britney Spears crept into the news, the, more, uh, the less I was able to tell you the important stuff. And so uh, uh, you're, you're going to have to do what my dad did, and, and that was, this was where they had two newspapers. Some of you remember that, a morning newspaper and an evening newspaper. And before he left for work in the morning, he read every page of the newspaper, every word of the newspaper. And when he came home, it took him two hours to read the evening newspaper, cover to cover, every word. And I said, why do you do that? He said, it's my job. He says, it's my job. He was a Republican. A Lincoln Roosevelt Republican. Um, but he was the best citizen I ever knew. Because he believed it was his job to know. Because he said, it's my job to run this country. Me and about 175 million other people. 
Any more questions here from the audience, please? Don, could I just yes, could please. I try to respond also to this yes. gentleman just real yes, quickly? Yes, absolutely. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to be brief. And I wish I, I wish I had known your father. Um, he sounds like a real genuine uh, person. Um, obviously, the, the media direct role is that of keeping the public honest and informing the public. But you've got to keep us honest. Um, I'm, I'm going to just step back for a second to what I started my first question about the good old days not being as good, folks. Um, and, and we you know, uh, have great people and great leaders of this country, but you don't want to go back. You don't want to go back to the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Minnesota when the decisions in the legislature were made in a closed room with bottles of booze at the St. Paul Hotel with 14 70-year-old white guys. That's how it was done. Yeah, I know. You don't want to go back there. Now, opening it up shows you a little bit of the ugliness. Of, you, you don't remember the ugliness back then, do you? No, you, we don't remember it. But it, opening it up shows you the difficulty, the struggles, the ugliness of the process. But we don't want to go back. You want to see the most you can about how the decisions are made, the, 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 the people making the speeches. It's good. But that's the reason, I think, that maybe we don't have the, uh, uh, the, the positive attitude towards our decision makers and the process today that maybe we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago because you actually see what is going on. By the way, those things were going on before, but they were done by 70-year-old white guys with a bottle of booze in the St. Paul Hotel behind a, behind a door. And a whole bunch of cigarettes. And a whole bunch of yeah. cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's better. It's, true. it's better that you see that. And that's maybe why, you know, right now we give... Congress and the state legislature, something like a 15 or 16 percent approval rating, because you see what's going on. The same dang thing was going on maybe 120 years ago, but it was closed. Let's 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 not go back. And and just one comment. I want you I want you to sit in the other chair for a second. Just sit there for a second. Don mentioned appropriately about global warming, he said 98%, 2%, there should be 98% of the news for global warming, 2% against it, whatever. As League of Women voters, uh, I found out today, didn't know it before, uh, but I found out today that you as an organization have, uh, have, are, are opposed to uh, photo identification. Yes. Okay. I, I respect that. The last poll I saw, the last poll I saw was 78% approval of the citizens for a photo ID. So I want you to just sit in the other chair and say, do you want to switch around and for the campaign on the constitutional amendment going up this fall or for the discussions, do you want 20% of that to be opposed to photo ID and 80% in favor? Just because that may be what the polls say or what nine, the 98 do. Put yourself in that position and just wonder if you want that. Now, I'm not saying anything about what your position should be or not, but uh, just to respond to Don's uh, comment about the 98-2, I, I, I think you would be very, very, very upset, very frustrated, and rightfully so, if over the next, what is it, to election time, 10 months? Yep. Eight months? Yep. 10 months. If over the next 10 months, 80% of the news was supportive of photo ID, 20% in opposition, which is a position you've taken. I, I think you'd be quite upset. Well, you're talking about a public opinion poll based on opinion. Uh, public, well, if you were talking about the science of security, yeah. I, I, I just want to. I want to talk to you a little I, bit. I'm not the, sure that 98 and two is not a non-public opinion. The, sci poll. the science of security. The science of security says that photo IDs do not prevent fraud. So I'm talking about scientists, not public opinion surveys. I'm not saying 98 percent of the public agrees. In fact, if you were 49% agree. So it's not, a, it's not a, you're doing apples and oranges on the... Uh, well, I'm not sure that 98% of the scientists agree. I, well, they I do. don't know that. They do. Okay. They do. Well, I'll, I'll, provi I'll provide you all the, okay. the information you, you need. You have a wonderful questioner waiting. All right, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> my name is Colleen Moriarty. I'm from Minneapolis. And my question really is a good segue for this because it's about constitutional amendments. Mm -hmm. It seems to me in this state that we've had a long history of constitutional amendments. Most of them have failed, but nonetheless, 
It seems to me that it, there is an abdication of responsibility for making decisions as governing bodies and that the use of constitutional amendments is being used as a proxy for uh, not being able to win success through the current legislative session. So I'd like your opinion on that. Well, can I start? First of all, um, having been there when a transportation constitutional mm -hmm. amendment went out to the ballot that went on to pass, the legacy amendment that went on to pass, um, I made it a habit to read the Constitution of the State of Minnesota every year in elected office and also to study the history of these amendments. And I think what you would be surprised about is there are many, many amendments that have been made to the Constitution over the years. Most of them are downright boring, though. They have to do with really minutia of how we deal with things in the Constitution that had to be dealt with constitutionally. Only recently have we entered into an era of what could be seen as, and I will say, you know, I supported the change to the Constitution on the Transportation Amendment. I supported the Legacy Amendment change. I have concerns about the current amendment going out. But I think what you're speaking to, Colleen, is really are we going down the pathway of backdoor initiative and referendum in the state of Minnesota. And I, I for one, have never been a fan of initiative and referendum, although I'd often point out to you, I know we had a great debate about this once, I think, in the Ways and Means Committee, that my longtime mentor, Don Ostrom, uh, always told me to study initiative and referendum well, because in many states, initiative and referendum actually brought the most progressive issues forward. And that if you were a progressive in some ways, you would, you would look at initiative and referendum as potentially a positive. I didn't agree with him. I didn't agree with him when I was in college, and I didn't agree with him when I was in the legislature. But I think you're speaking to the more recent history because there have been many amendments to our state constitution, often very minutia and very boring about mill rate and all sorts of things that you're sort of like, wow, I had no idea. And you think, how did people get educated, you know, in 1955 to pass this constitutional amendment? Because it's a high hurdle to pass a constitutional amendment. You know, it has to be of those voting and all those things. So I will say that I think everybody has a bit of a concern when it seems like, you know, I'll tell you, Representative Rukavina every single year wanted me to put the, the income tax constitutional amendment out on the ballot. He said that thing, it polls, you know, it, I mean, it's kind of the precursor to the Occupy movement, which would have been send out to Minnesotans a constitutional amendment that said you have to raise the income tax. Um, I'm not a fan of initiative and referendum, but I do think there's a concern right now. Did you want, I, I see you looking at me and I see Carol walking up to the podium, so I don't know if you want. I don't know if you want more, if that's I, enough. I mean, yeah. I think there's an interesting history of them. And so to say blanket, they're all bad, that's not quite fair. I do think there's been a, a movement towards legislating, uh, backdoor legislating through them. It's actually a move backwards. For those of you who uh, know your uh, constitutional history, that the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States protects in its last clause uh, the right of the people to pet petition their government for redress of grievance. Uh, during the first Congresses of the United States, the only legislation that was ever brought to the floor was brought by petition of the people. Mm -hmm. So all law that we had in the establishment of our first uh, four Congresses were uh, all instituted by the people brought to their well, representatives. And that's a history out of, out of where we came from because the term speaker actually is a term that meant the people could plead to the king through the speaker. So, you know, we, we, have, a, we have a complex history here with where we came from and the, the growing up of the democracy, the growing up of the people to see you know, where we are today. So I think that made total sense that right. that would have been the, the way things were done. And when communication got uh, stronger, then representational forms of yes. government became uh, more positive. Yes. That we, the people then sent right. their information forward with the representatives, right. and then, then the uh, <laughs> legislature began to act. Somebody was just standing up. Oh, <laughs> please say your name. 
Carol Frisch. I'm a past president of the League of Women Voters in Minnesota, and I just wanted to clarify a misconception that might people might leave the room thinking that the League of Women Voters rates candidates, mm -hmm. and we do not. We do not rate candidates, or we do not rate uh, officials based on their votes. And uh, I thought that impression was conveyed earlier. Or do you endorse them? No, we don't. Correct. Right. And I and, and I appreciate that. I heard that. I didn't want to interrupt you, Speaker. So I, but I, um, but I. I Heard that too, and no, we don't. Okay. Did, but I, did I, I say that the League of Women voted? Well, yeah. that was. No, I don't think so. I, I said that. there are many groups that rate. Okay. I, I don't know if I said. You put the us League in there with it, but you may okay. not have meant it. And yeah. that's what, so we just wanted to clarify there, it. I okay. I, I realize the League of Women Voters doesn't, but okay. I will guarantee you I have 50 groups when I was Speaker that rated me every year. Oh, yeah. Right? There are a lot Margaret? of groups right. do, certainly. Right. And all advocacy groups. I, I, if I said League of Women Voters was one of them that did, I must spoke. I don't okay. remember I did. I'm sure I probably did as I, you know, well, I, my tongue sometimes works quicker in my head. <laughs> I'll just go on from there to ask you a follow-up question, okay. if I might. Uh, I got the impression you were saying that Senator Anderson, part of the reason she was not confirmed was that she would uh, lead to the loss of jobs and to rate payer increases. And I wondered if you'd clarify that. Okay. Um, I think it is a uh, assessment by some, and uh, you may or may not agree with it, Carol, uh, but there's an assessment by, by many that, uh, uh, that some of the policy decisions uh, that were uh, promoted by Senator Anderson went a, went a senator, and I've read all the bills she introduced and all the, the bills that were passed. Uh, I've had to do that the last couple of days, and that's pretty boring too, Don. <laughs> um, but I, th I think there is a certainly assessment by some that, that uh, uh, her um, policy positions would lead to uh, significant increases for rate payers in the state. Uh, and that would also in terms job producers and jobs. Now, you may or may not agree with it, Carol, That's, that, that you have that right. But there are others in a chair next to you, maybe not the chair next to you, but the chair at the someplace down here, uh, who, who, uh, who would feel very strongly that, 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 is very, that that's true. Um, you know, it's... Uh, Alternative energies and policies don't don't always they're not always the most cost effective if you're looking at ratepayers and job providers. That's all the time we have for questions tonight. And uh, please remain uh, seated as we conclude our program this evening. We're going to take a minute to thank the panelists for participating in the uh, discussion and thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters of Bloomington, Edina, Minnesota, and the Joyce Foundation for sponsoring the forum. Uh, you can view uh, this forum on the Bloomington and Edina City websites or watch a rebroadcast on the Bloomington City Channel 14 or Edina City Channel 16. For more information on voting, please visit the League of Women Voters Minnesota election website. And thank you for attending tonight's forum. And please remember to attend your local caucuses on February 7th and vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you very much to our panelists tonight. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. And thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you.